Good afternoon and welcome back to this episode on Digital Craft and TV. I'm here with our illustrious leader, Simon. Good Hello. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to your own YouTube channel. Thank you very much. <laughs> welcome back, should I yes. say. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be talking about all those evil robots that are coming to take our jobs. Yeah. Because automation is on the rise and mm -hmm. we all know it's a destructive force and it's to blame for all of the evils in the world. Yep. Or is it? Yes and no. As these, yes as these, and these, no. As these, as these things always are, there's always a, um, there's a good side and a bad side to these, to these things. So, um, as, as we've seen the rise of automation, or the rise of, of virtualization to mm -hmm. start with, and then the rise of, the rise of public cloud and, and, and private cloud and hybrid and so on, um, a lot of the skill, traditional skills that you needed um, in, a, in an enterprise IT department uh, have gone away. So we need fewer and fewer skills to deal with um, physical tin, mm -hmm. um, physical servers on site. More and more servers are moving off site, um, either to a co-location facility or into uh, or in, uh, just, just being replaced by cloud. Um, and software is being um, replaced by uh, you know kind of continual development cloud native type technologies um, what that tends to mean is that the skills that we used to employ for in terms of people who knew how to run cables and do tin and do all that stuff um, an enterprise needs far fewer of those skills they're no longer um, relevant on mass they're, they're not so relevant on mass but they're still necessary because there's still some equipment that need, needs to be installed on site you just can't get away from it um, if you've got a reasonably large site you have to have some kind of on-site authentication technology um, because otherwise it's just too slow and you need to have um, you know you need there'll be some sort of networking routers and things to connect you to the internet and perhaps connect your offices together um, but that's not an all-consuming day job in the way that it used to be. Uh, and what that means is that now they, a company doesn't need all those skills, but when something goes wrong, they need all those skills, um, which is where a, uh, an MSP um, will come, it really comes into its own because we have all of those skills um, and you can have them uh, on site for you know, as often as you need them, um, but we're out there keeping our skills up to date, making sure that we know what's going on, making sure we understand how those systems go together so that when um, something really does go wrong, we're in a good place to be able to respond to, uh, you know, to those problems. Um, and likewise, I think as automation starts to um, become more prevalent in the cloud, so we're looking at, um, uh, I think it's uh, AWS Guard Duty recently launched, um, which will use the dreaded AI to, um, to, to, to un try and understand your logs, your system logs. Um, the job of the humans in the chain um, is to understand and respond to the errors and things that, that, that it finds, uh, which again requires a, a knowledge and an understanding of a system that is only needed when there's a problem. Um, and of course to design the infrastructure properly in the first place to make sure that you minimise the risk of those kind of problems. Yep. So whilst, uh, whilst a lot of those old school jobs are, are disappearing and right now you need to have a you need to work for a data center pretty much or work for a public you know work for amazon if you want to touch the tin um, the skills that are needed now are more kind of nuanced skills of being able to understand what the messages are and how they apply and how you can what you're going to do about it what the response is going to be planning and uh, planning and training for those those eventualities when you have a problem so i think that's that's those skills are changing they're still needed and is, does that reflect a change in mindset as well? I mean, you, you and I have had numerous conversations around two topics. The first is flexibility in delivering the kind of operating model that a customer wants, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, private cloud, colo, whatever it is, yeah. give choice to the customer. And then the second one was this idea of the, the economy of expertise. You're only going to find that within a managed yeah. services provider or a specialist yeah. that has, you know, enough people trained mm -hmm. up in order to maintain certifications yeah. because this is what they do day in day out. That's it's right. not. I used yeah. to lay cabling. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's. I think that's right. I think that's the the, 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 the challenge that enterprises, small small enterprises, large medium sized businesses yeah. have, is that they just don't have enough work to justify having someone on full time. Um, but the problem is that you can only 
hire, if you're hiring a person, you can really only hire one person. Um, so even if you can afford to have one person who knows all that stuff, they are just one person. So when they, you know, when they want to have a holiday, because we have to let people have holidays, uh, holidays, or they're 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 keeping their training up to date, um, so on training course, or they're or they're in, or, or if they're ill. Um, then there's no one there who understands what's going on, which is which for certain types of businesses is a considerable risk and one that they should address by um, typically you address it by hiring several different people, um, but with the with the lack of um, you know with the lack of, of need for those people, um, you can't afford to hire them. So uh, you know turning to someone like an MSP who is keeping those skills up to date, who is understanding what they what the market is doing, um, who have people who are experiencing problems, if you've got a good problem solver, you need to give them problems to solve, um, otherwise they get bored and will leave. So I think as long as you, you know, MSP type operations have the ability to, um, you know, to, to attract and retain some of the best people so that we have, um, you know, so that we can, uh, you know, we can, we can respond quickly to people's, people's challenges. That, that's, that's such an important point to make. I mean, in a lot of our, our videos and our discussions together, we're, we're talking about the perspective of the client, the perspective of the, the business and the enterprise running IT. What about, what about keeping the talent happy? Is there an, an advantage to becoming a, you know, ha having a very narrow domain expertise within the enterprise that may become relevant in two years? Um, go. <laughs> um, I think there's. I, I, that's, that's a really good question. I think that the most important thing is that good problem solvers like solving problems, so you have to give them problems. Um, but the. The, 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 the difficulty with that, of course, is that we want to engineer systems that have as few problems as possible. Of course. Um, so uh, those people who like solving problems also like designing interesting things. So you have to give them a complete. You know, a, a long, you have to keep their interest by keep giving them interesting things to do, difficult problems to solve. New problems, new projects. New, new problems, clients. new projects, new clients, all yeah. of those things are, are vital to keep the kind of people that we want to that we work with, that we want to we want to work with, who are, you know, they're they're curious and they're you know they're widely read and they you know they, they understand all sorts of systems. They can they have a mental model of how these systems work mm -hmm. that is quite technical and they can ad adapt that technical model and, their, and those skill sets to just about any system. So um, quite often we come across, you know, when we're talking to clients, we'll come across a system that we've never seen before, but that doesn't really matter because we basically know how it all works. So we can, you know, there's, there's a small bit we don't understand, so we work to understand that bit and then we understand that for the next client. So those kind of stretches of, of of people you know, doing new stuff is what keeps people interested. That's true. That's a really important point to make for the kind of people that we would attract. Yeah. Given our engineering mm. culture, our, our belief that variety mm. can be the spice of life as well. Absolutely. Now, moving on to the final segment of this, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the changing role of the systems administrator and the yeah. changing role of uh, the developer. I mean, Over the last four, maybe five years, we've been heavily exposed to um, changes in the way that software is written yep. or the way that software is commissioned. Mm -hmm. We've seen significant levels of abstraction from the infrastructure up to the past mm -hmm. layer. Functions as a service is yep. just about to hit the mainstream mm -hmm. along with new, um, new data applications, yep. things like this. Where do you see the convergence between... Uh, development and systems administration. I mean, we've talked about DevOps, mm -hmm. but we've got a slightly different take on things, don't we? We do. Um, the interesting thing is that developers and systems administrators come at these problems from almost two completely opposing views. Um, developers love change. That's why they. That's why they do what they do. They're making new things. Systems administrators typically. Don't like change. Hence, things like Dilbert's MORDAC, the Preventive Information <laughs> Services. Yeah, they change. Change has to be considered, and, and in today's world, where things are changing much more, the administrator is more concerned with the kind of external-facing security of things, mm -hmm. of of the resilience of them, of planning DR, of planning how all these things are going to work. Whereas the developer tends to be more incentivized around the functionality that they build. Now, that's not true everywhere. Some places do build in metrics. 
metrics into their into their measurement systems for their staff that do look at things like have you built in security, have you planned for DR, and so on. But most of the people that we we encounter, um, developers are very much about here's the new thing we're dri we're driving to the new product, we're making the new thing, and in a slightly traditional world, I suppose when it gets handed over to um, to to the operations team, and um, the operations team are then re re responsible for making it resilient and making it work. Where I think the convergence is coming together is that um, the, the developers have to adapt more to the security mindset. They have to make sure that they are building from scratch systems that are going to work well in a cloud native environment, that are, you know, that are, are capable of working across multiple sites, that are not traditional one machine runs it all kind of designs. Um, and the administrators have to be a little bit more embracing of um, of the of change in terms of, of, of faster release cycles mm -hmm. and so on, which is also a business issue. Um, but once that's in place, the administrator's role then becomes one that is more of uh, a monitoring and oversight type of role. So it's about establishing the standards that the developers should work to and about making sure that those standards are followed. And then ultimately, effectively, what becomes the, the network operation centre or the security operation centre um, in terms of, of monitoring the system as it, as it goes through. So developers, developers need to be available. They need to be accountable for the reliability of their system in production. Um, and, um, and a very good friend of ours is working um, in, in an operation where she is, is responsible for making sure that her developers um, you know, really buy into the fact that they are responsible for how well it performs in mm. production. Um, and um, and what we see is the the administrators then become uh, much more associated with a sort of overall security and governance and and, and performance optimization and cost optimization um, within the public cloud. So their their role becomes slightly different in terms of in terms of the things that they need to do. I mean, this this seems to be a much more uh, mature, nuanced analysis. If we were to take a step back and look at what DevOps is and what it is not. Mm -hmm. We tend to talk, you know, DevOps does not mean move fast and break things with <laughs> the operations people saying, just don't break it, just don't break it, just don't break it. Yeah. We, f we see DevOps as a methodology mm -hmm. that has to do with the developer taking on more responsibility for what they're actually doing yeah. with the code in a production or test environment. Yeah. And putting, when we talk about continuous integration, mm -hmm. continuous delivery, we look at that as a, as a methodology, test-driven development is something mm -hmm. that has an operational impact. Yeah. But in the same way that you know operations has not so much spend into development, it's development that has spent into operations, but whatever operations lost in terms mm -hmm. of their role, you're saying that there's a third thing here, that operations has now moved into security. Yeah. So it's the conversion of operations and security, yeah. but development has taken on a wider operational role. Yes, correct. And that seems to be the you know the source of the misunderstanding. We see security as something that has to be there and mm. can't get around. We see move fast and break things is a great way of innovating and, and prototyping, mm -hmm. but not at the expense of losing security or stability over your production environment. No. And we see that the changing roles of operations folks yep. has to become more of a systems architect or a solutions architect in terms of understanding the base components. Yeah. We had a chat with Paul, our technical director, yeah. around the building blocks and how to yeah. move them around. But I think it's it's very clear now that the security mindset bleeds into operations, mm -hmm. and that is the day-to-day -day reality. Yeah. Development and the methodology for producing cloud-native software has changed and mm -hmm. taken up more operations. Final question is, where does that leave the MSP? The MSP is, is providing um, a set of exp experience. You said um, uh, uh, expertise, economies, um, of expertise. Economy, economies of expertise earlier on. Um, and I think that's, that's the key thing. Some of this stuff, as it becomes a little bit more abstract, I think some of, these stuff, some of this stuff becomes harder to understand. You yeah. can't, you know, you need to do more work to become skilled in those in those areas. Yeah. The, the days when you could you could bluff your way into a web developer job just because you could write a bit of HTML is long gone, or at least it should be. Um, you have to know about these things, and you have to study these things. Um, and whilst the business can take a certain amount of operational risk um, by saying, well, we'll hire Joe Bloggs, he can just get on with it. 
um, because he knows about these things and we'll just sweat him and we'll make him work all weekend and we'll make him work his holidays you know he'll never be he'll never um, not be on duty um, I think it's safer for businesses when they when they have some risk of being online. Um, it's safer for those businesses to use an MSP where they get a range of skills available to them um, that are highly skilled and highly experienced, um, and use those for um, for. Uh, making sure that they, you know, that, that they've got all the skills in house that they need, or all the skills available to them in house when they need them, provided by an MSP that can do a number of different things. Um, to conclude on, on on that point, we see that the choice to hire an MSP is one of fear or one of pragmatism. The the fear of loss. Yep. I'm I'm hiring digital craftsmen to prevent something from going wrong. Yep. You've architected it right. You're, you're yep. you've got your predictive mm -hmm. monitoring method. Whereas the the pragmatic would say that things will always go wrong because we manage them in house or or that mm -hmm. there's a span of responsibility, but we don't have the expertise or the coverage. Yep. We don't have the skills coverage to respond to something when it goes wrong. Yep. So even if we wanted to go cloud native, <laughs> we can't. Yeah, there's certainly there's certainly a, a something in that in the the, um, the skills needed to take advantage of a lot of these cloud technologies um, are not ones that you can just sort of pick up and, and run with. You do need to spend some time working with them to make sure that they're secured properly. Um, there's a there, there's a, a there's a, a, a number whole, regularly you get things like MongoDB um, instances that haven't been properly secured and made available on the web. If you're not thinking those things, if that's not part of your mindset, then you won't you won't cover those things and you'll put your business at risk. Whereas using an MSP that is security focused from the start means that we're you know we're naturally paranoid about making sure that the data doesn't leak, that we don't sure. have those problems. And you know touch wood so far, you know that's not been a problem for us. Well, Simon, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent episode. See you thank next you. time, folks.